sad issue of suicide among the Turkish, Kurdish and Cypriot uh, diaspora in Europe. I think we've got about seven, six or seven speakers lined up for you. I'm afraid we're experiencing a slight technical problem at the moment in as much as we had ordered a laptop so that all the speakers could give their presentations but unfortunately the laptop hasn't arrived yet um, and so you'll have to bear with us. Um, we've got one hopefully on its way which should be with us in the next five minutes. Um, so we're going to ask one of the panellists to start us off who um, has very kindly said she doesn't require um, a laptop uh, to do that. And I think I'm right in saying that's Dr. Ezra Kaglar. I feel this is also a test to pronounce <laughs> all the Turkish and uh, different surnames correctly. So my apologies in advance um, if I get it wrong. Um, Dr. Kaglar is a consultant child psychiatrist and adolescent psychiatrist at the Tavistock Clinic. And I think she is going to be talking about how an individual's psychological development um, and family dynamics might contribute to mental health problems and what some of the barriers are in terms of accessing help. So I'll hand straight over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased to be talking today on such an important topic. I believe it requires both courage and thoughtfulness to discuss this. I would like to share my understanding of early emotional development and family dynamics that contribute to suicide. The focus group of today is largely the second generation immigrant population. I base my understanding on my training in psychiatry and psychological therapies, but most importantly, on my experiences as a clinician working with many Turkish speaking families, both in the NHS and in the independent sector. One of the leading sociologists, Durkheim, postulates that suicide is caused by lack of integration and regulation of the individual within the society. I believe that this is a good description of not only a social problem, but most importantly, a psychosocial and developmental problem. When one finds himself, and I'm going to refer to here um, when I think about the theoretical child, when one finds himself in a situation that how he feels about himself and his life is exactly the same as what goes on around him in reality, then the reality becomes very concrete. It's a concrete fact. He can't think flexibly. He can't see any other option of either feeling differently about himself or having a different life. He feels totally helpless and stuck. There's no escape other than destroying himself by killing himself and therefore destroying his reality. I'm going to explain how one ends up in this awful position. We can all agree that a baby is born to this world completely incapable of survival and requires constant attention to stay alive. The caregiver, mainly the mother, has to feed, bath, rock, sing, hold the baby to enable his survival. The baby learns to cope with extreme emotional pain and distress by experiencing that his distress can be taken in and relieved by the caregiver. For example, the mother copes with the baby's crying and gives him food and changes his nappy and the baby stops crying and goes to sleep. The toddler, on the other hand, who's technically in his most violent age, um, throws a tantrum, mother both sues the, to uh, sues the toddler and puts boundaries to the behaviour and soon he learns that being angry is actually okay and and it can be dealt with. In the first few years, by knowing that his needs will be met by the parents, you know, that he'll be fed and protected, um, the child will learn to endure stress, distress and emotional pain, so he starts being patient and hopeful and curious to explore the world. He will slowly develop self-confidence and resilience. So if any of the things I've just discussed goes wrong, for example, if the baby's needs are not met, the mother is too preoccupied with other things and can't understand the baby's distress, or the angry toddler is, met, is responded by more angry and violent parents, then the child cannot emotionally integrate himself. He becomes fearful, angry and confused. He can potentially go into adulthood feeling exactly the same way whenever he faces problems. Fearful, angry, confused, not being able to cope. 
he will be overloaded with shame, guilt, and resentment. Learning how to regulate one's emotions happens mostly within the first five years of life, and this is where the problem is. So, coming back to our topic, what happens when a child grows up in a Turkish or Kurdish speaking family is already experienced generations of trauma and is potentially very vulnerable? The parents are going to see the world as a dangerous place. They are often overprotective and controlling. It makes it very difficult for the child to separate and to feel that he can actually survive in this world by himself. He feels anxious. When the child's intense emotions are met with either harsh discipline or lack of it, the child will not gain the confidence to become independent. From a very early age, the child will, in, will interpret for parents, I'm sure a lot of you would know about this. This is a significant responsibility on his shoulders. So it's almost as if he's the parent, and he often comes to know about parents' problems way too early. This worries them and confuses them. He can also get a false impression that he's already grown up and should be sorting out things on his own without support. The child will become aware of how things are different at all than the outside family or um, friends at school. He often hears from his parents that his parents feel excluded and marginalised and not being cared for. It's very sad that I often hear from families that they do not trust professionals. They say professionals do not understand. Their professions are felt to be against them, making them worse. The child, feel, the child feels he is being forced to choose between either integrating into the culture or remaining with their heritage culture. He learns to manage the situation by having different roles on different occasions, the same way that he can switch between languages. What a teenager naturally does is to take on different role models and act like them. One day he can be like his mom, the other day he can be to music that he, his dad likes, or another day he has, he has to start his favorite pop star. Experimenting different roles is what being a teenager is all about. He becomes stuck in between cultures and different practices. One of the most common examples is going on and having your own friends and boyfriends, which causes lots of conflict. In a traditional family setting, conformity and family honor are very important. There is often a cohesive small community that provides valuable support. The problem is that the individuals in the family put enormous emphasis on external validation. There are set limiting and restricting rules that each family member should obey to keep their honour. This in turn puts them in an extremely fragile position. If you remember, the child grows up in an environment where intense emotions can't be contained and problems can't be resolved. Then the child finds himself in a wider social system that in his eyes functions by blaming and attacking him. This can be emotional or physical. On top of that, the family holds him responsible for any wrongdoing, causing shame before the family. The teenager ends up feeling furious, anxious and stuck. If he chooses to become more integrated, then he fears being excluded, resented and hated by the family and society. If he makes a choice, he will practically feel guilty and angry either way. If he doesn't make a choice, he'll risk taking his family against him. He's going to start life on the wrong foot, which will eventually lead on to shame, anger and feeling like a failure. He fails to um, find, the, find where he belongs in the world. He fails to have internal integrity and confidence and robustness that he can function in this world. He asks himself the question, who am I? And there isn't any answer. One of the problems of early, early failure in emotional regulation and integration is developing an emotional defense that one can do anything and he is all powerful, knows the best, best and doesn't need any help, and everyone else is used the same way. The other part of the coin is a very harsh, critical, damning inner voice. If you're anything other than perfect, and that perfect is usually how he thinks his family would like him to be, then he's nothing. It's about utter humiliation. Even if the teenager comes out of this breakdown somehow, sub subsequent ones may follow, I mean, likely, most likely to follow, and each time he becomes more frustrated and dysfunctional. I often hear from patients, my family is not going to change, what's the point of me changing? Well, I do believe this may be a factual reality, but this is also an emotional reality. In his mind, he says, I'm not 
going to change because nobody showed me how to. How to be flexible, how to cope, and therefore I'm going to keep being angry and resentful and hold them responsible. The emotion of the group will contaminate its experiences with the support services. My GP doesn't know how to treat me. I don't trust her. How can she help me anyway? So more isolation, more desperate, and a huge grievance for a life that's not fulfilled. Lastly, I would like to remind us that suicide leaves, suicide leaves enormous marks and gaps in family histories and societies. It takes generations for the brutal losses to be understood and worked through. There's, this, there's both a factual importance, but also metaphorical importance of being able to talk about suicide at Jails of Commons. I feel very motivated and inspired by this event, and I'm sure you share my feelings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ezra. Um, I should have said at the beginning that we will take all the speakers and then there'll be about 45, 50 minutes at the end for you to ask questions. So if you've got any questions for Ezra, make a note of them now, um, and then we'll make sure that we've got plenty of time for that discussion when everyone is making their remarks. <coughs> um, I was struck by something you said about the importance of speaking about suicide in the House of Commons, and it being quite symbolic. The House of Commons Health Select Committee in the last Parliament did an inquiry um, into suicide prevention um, and so it is really important that we talk about um, these issues um, from a particular cultural perspective as well and I think some of the insights that you gave us about the, the tensions, the dynamics, the feelings of a young person growing up in a country that may not be the country of their own parents um, and some of the, the difficulties that might bring about um, I think was a, a really powerful way to start the evening, so thank you. Um, I'm trying to continue speaking until the, um, the laptop is up <laughs> um, But it looks good because um, the, the screen has come on and I think that means you can stop hearing me talk and you can actually hear instead um, from Dr. Minia, I think I've pronounced your first name wrong, right? Yeah. Yeah. Kaluchi? Okay. <laughs> Um, and Amini is a senior lecturer in psychology at the School of Science and Technology at the Department of Psychology of Middlesex University, and I think you're going to talk more generally about suicide amongst people from immigrant and refugee backgrounds. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here talking about this. So we have no pointer, so could I give some signs to change the slide? Uh, can, you can I give you a sign? Okay, next. <laughs> next. <laughs> yeah. So we can look, show the map. Yeah, sure. Okay. Map is coming <laughs> on the screen of the world. Which we have lots of colors. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay. So uh, this map, map of the world uh, indicates the suicide rates in different countries. So if I can get you to point to India, for example, which is a country where I do, I know, India on the map. Should I come there? India? India? Yeah. Point it. Okay. <laughs> India. <laughs> India is red. Yeah. India is red because it has a very high rate of suicide. Well, if you look at Italy, which is the country where I come from, as you might guess, I'm sure you know what that is. Italy is a country which historically has had a very low rate of suicide. Okay, so this is kind of the picture about countries that show different kind of rates. What, the, what this tells us is suicide rates vary across different cultural groups, which basically means that the shared meanings and beliefs and norms that people kind of share comes with them. It's part of the kind of cultural um, um, context of suicide. Now, if you can go to the next slide, uh, there, are, there is a lot of research indicating what I just said, the influence of culture and ethnicity on suicide. For example, in this literature review I did three years ago about young people in particular showed that uh, culture not only influences the rates of suicide, but also has an impact on the method of suicide, has an impact on the risk and protective factors for suicide, and also on precipitating factors, as well as on attitudes and values and beliefs around suicide, and health-seeking behavior. So basically it has an impact on everything. I did a, a multi-country, multi-method study about suicide and culture, looking in particular at uh, young people in India, Italy, and Australia, which was published in this book here called Suicide and Culture, Understanding the Context. 
Um, so what, what this study kind of shows, if I can summarize thousands of words in 52 words, I'm trying. So what are kind of the key findings of this study was that in, in the young, uh, uh, Italian young people, uh, the discourse around suicide had elements around the shared involvement. So in some way people were feeling that they were part of the suicide, was interpreted as a kind of uh, interpersonal, a society kind of issue where people are themselves involved in some way in the reason why people might kill themselves and in preventing suicide. Now, similar kind of uh, um, community level, society level understanding of suicide was also present in India, with the difference that in India was very prevalent the presence of very negative attitudes towards suicide and people who might be considering suicide. Now, that's what this means is that young people were saying, people were suicidal, they were very scared to talk about suicide because of the possible implication of sharing that they were feeling suicidal. Now, also, the gender issues were very centered in, in, uh, in India because there was a very clear, clear kind of impact of being a woman in terms of suicide, in terms of having a lower status, but also in terms of abuse against women, which has a very strong impact on suicide. In Australia, uh, the, the kind of discourse was much more biomedical. The, by this I mean that people were talking much more about depression, about mental illness as linked to suicide. So, so the discourse around suicide was much more personal, individual, at the interpersonal and society level. Gender issues were also present in Australia, but they were much more about men, where men were seen as kind of this kind of macho man who doesn't cry and kind of pull himself together. Now, very briefly, it's an overview where you can see how the same kind of topic, the same kind of issue, was understood very differently in these three contexts. Now, summarizing this kind of research and other research in this area, what we found is that cultural determinants, system of meanings and beliefs cannot be neglected in prevention of suicide and research on suicide because these are very powerful influences on people's way of approaching suicide, both their own, their own life and other people's life. Cultural factors have an effect on people's belief about what are causes for suicide and also about the ideas about how to prevent suicide, including the possibility that actually suicide is something preventable, and also the kind of acceptability of the options available to prevent suicide. Now, what is interesting is that with this kind of cultural beliefs, values, and norms, kind of people carry them with them when they migrate to other countries. So what we find is, in general, suicide rates in people from migrant refugee background tends to reflect the rates in the country of origin. And this kind of, of research comes from many countries, from Australia, UK, Canada, and so on. What this means is that when Indian mig Indian, uh, Indians migrate to a country, they will bring with them the kind of high risk for suicide, while Italians will tend to show lower rate of suicide, even when they migrate. And this kind of effect, it also shows in the second generation migrants. So the kind of rate of, of uh, the second generation migrants is similar to the country of origin. However, research is also showing um, that, uh, that uh, there is kind of a, a higher risk for suicide among migrants. So although people kind of being with them, the kind of risk for suicide from the country of origin, being migrant in itself, seems to actually increase the risk for suicide. Now, we don't have a clear understanding about what actually happens, what are the mechanisms, but we know there are some factors that seem to possibly increase the risk of suicide among migrants. For example, domestic violence is very strongly linked to suicide. Yeah? It's a very strong link. And there is evidence, very high evidence, that there are higher levels of violence experienced by migrant women and girls. At the point that there was a note of Walker argued that migration from one country to another seems to foster isolation that breeds more domestic violence, no matter where a woman lives. So the migration itself seems to contribute to women be a higher risk for domestic violence. I published, you can see that, but it's available online if you want to have the papers, I can give them if you write me an email. But this is a literature review and a call for action, really, about violence against women among migrants. And some of the studies cited in this review, you can go to the next slide, um, indicates, for example, this study from Batarik shows that a quarter of female immigrants from Turkey to Switzerland who had attempted suicide mentioned violence in family and partnership as their main problem. There was also another big study done in the Netherlands 
uh, with uh, young people from different countries, including uh, Turkish, which shows that although these factors do not fully explain vulnerability, the South Asian Surinamese females and Turkish uh, experience physical and sexual violence contributed to no further to other behavior. Yeah? Another study always in this country also indicates that sort of behavior was influenced by the ability and right to act autonomously with regard to strategic life choices, as well as by the questioning of cultural values of self-sacrifice and protection of honor. And there is quite a big body of literature, relatively speaking, looking at the link between honor and suicide. So some examples of the studies showing a strong link with domestic violence and suicide and higher rates between among mother and women. Now, another kind of uh, body literature also indicates that not only women from migrant uh, background have a higher risk for domestic violence, they also have more barriers in accessing help, to seeking help and receiving help. Just to give you an example, there was a, a study indicating that immigrant women often feel trapped because of immigration itself, because of the law of immigration, the fear of deportation, but because of the language barrier, social isolation, lack of financial resources, so women feel trapped that sometimes suicide becomes the only option. It's perceived as the only way out. Uh, also, another study concluded that for immigrant women, domestic violence occurs against backdrop of social and economic marginalization. That is similar to, but is also extremely different from women who are mainstream. Now, what I want to say is kind of, of, of evidence is that this is very important, it's essential. When we talk about prevention of suicide, we have an understanding about the social cultural context and we respond to the needs of the migrant population in different ways, pro providing kind of health strategies that can meet their particular need. Just as an example, with a group I was based in Australia, we developed these uh, uh, suicide first aid guidelines for people from migrant and refugee background. This was a research project with experts, by lived experience and professional experts, about how to come up with some kind of guidelines that members of the public, which is basically all of us, can use to recognize what might be some warning signs for suicide and what actually are some kind of action that everybody can basically do if somebody uh, close to them, a friend, a classmate, a workmate, a family member, from a migrant refugee background, is a risk of suicide. The idea that the suicide is something that everybody is part of and everybody can contribute to prevent. So these are the guidelines that are available online if anybody is interested, and there is also an infographic which kind of summarizes and gives the key points around this kind of, of tools. Okay, so now concluding, really kind of summarizing a work I'm very passionate about in very few lines, the key messages from this presentation is that people from migrant and refugee background are a higher risk of suicide for different fa factors, including because they might be higher risk of discrimination, marginalization, and violence. Second point is a cultural factor, factor influence every aspect of suicide from the reason why some people might be at higher risk of suicide to the help seeking, to be able to receive help. Therefore, a prevention of suicide must consider cultural issues, which includes also the, the people's spiritual and religious beliefs and also their gender, considering gender meanings of suicide. And this is also supported by the WHO, the World Health Organization, which says that adapted programs have shown promising results when they are tailored to specific population. That also means that clinically based approach are only one of the strategy cannot be the only way to prevent suicide. Prevention of suicide requires a multi-sectorial, multi-component approach is not only about mental health services. That's one part of the prevention strategy. And the last point that's very important is that the strategies must be based on the voices of the people we're trying to help, which basically means they must include and be based on the perspective of people who actually have themselves experienced with suicide. So that's really it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Nurse Al Tass now to make her contribution. Um, Nurse was the Chief Executive of Derman, which, as I understand it, is a charity that's been running for 26 years, providing health and social care services um, to the Turkish, Kurdish, and um, uh, Turkish Cypriot communities. So, thank you. Thank you.
thank you very much. First of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, I very All right. I'm not very sure. I think it's a question.
And what are the uh, problems, mental health problems uh, that are coming from? It's a multiple losses, a country, culture, family, profession, friends, and identity. Depression is high, and post-traumatic stress disorder, isolation, anxiety, psychosis, and addiction, and then the relationship problem, because this adaptation process uh, has put enormous pressure on the relationship. And families, when they're coming here, and because we are very uh, patriarchal, the father is dominant in the house, most of them, they can't speak English. The children learn very quickly. They become a parent. Pe um, parents become a child. Therefore, in the hierarchy in the family is changing the structure. This has a lot of effect uh, in terms of in dynamics in the family. Psychosomatic problem is very high, and suicide, we are here for this. Um, in um, 11 men committed suicide, it was a cluster of suicide in a short period of time. Um, three of them were under 25. And according to the Alevi Cultural Center, between 2003 and 2017, 48 people from our community committed suicide. What I'm referring to Alevi Cultural Center, because most of the coroner's report, they don't say suicide because of variety of the reason. The family, they don't want to upset the family, um, some other issues as well. Therefore, we don't know the exact numbers of suicide cases. Alevi Cultural Center, uh, Center is providing funeral um, for, for, the, for our community. Therefore, we know this number from the frontline uh, results. Um, next. Um, but there are some issues associated with suicide in, in the community. Immigration problem, which is uncertain features. Uh, I know clients, because I was a therapist myself, uh, they waited 10 years for immigration status from the Home Office. This waiting period is devastating for the people. Um, and the social and housing problem. Problems relating being a refugee, adaptation difficulties, separation, adjustment, the cultural dislocation as well. And racism, uh, unemployment, low income, social exclusion based on misunderstanding migrants culture, lack of family and social support. Um, now I will talk about this a bit, Diamond, what we do. What we do. Um, in, uh, 2006, we organized a conference because we were very concerned about suicide ideation, suicide thoughts among our clients. Therefore, we wanted to have this conference on the Mental Health Day in 2006. Uh, um, the aim was developing appropriate approaches to, uh, for recognizing uh, signs and prevention for suicide. And also, we did the we conducted we conducted the research uh, among mental health needs assessment among men with the delivering race equality uh, agenda with the University of Central Lancashire. And then we also ran a grieving group for many years for mothers who don't committed suicide from the figures I gave in 2008. Um, we are still providing one-to-one -one uh, counseling service and some group activities. I mean, key message from the conference what we did was prevent that the suicide is preventable and what do we need to do? Improving training in the risk assessment and developing a better cultural competency among those working with Turkish, Turkish uh, communities and improving co uh, cooperation and collaboration among professionals. And I will um, now talk about a little bit, uh, I will give you some case examples, I'm finishing earlier. Um, recently, we did a snapshot of current clients, and this is very high number, 34% of current clients have suicidal thinking. Um, when we did the research previously, 42 of them personally knew people 
who committed or attempted to commit suicide, a relative, neighbor, or friend. Um, most of the time, although we offer one-to-one -one service and group, it's, our service is limited, and we are no crisis intervention service. But uh, we are, the, as a voluntary community organization, and because of the language barrier, we are the first point of contact as a voluntary organization. And when they are, I can give you two examples. One man, for example, he went to the park and he, get, he had the rope and he wanted to hang, hang himself and he contacted us and we tried to talk to him but the phone cut off and we knew his name and his phone number. We didn't know where he was, which park he was. We tried to contact him several times, it was no answer. We contacted the police and we said we know his name and the telephone number. They found him from the telephone signals, which part he was. He's been admitted to hospital. And he, the day after, he contacted us saying, he says, thank you, you saved my life. And it was another case, and he sent the email. We didn't know who, who he was, with the address, name, just the email, saying he was very low. He's thinking to take uh, overdose. He wants to kill himself. We send an email back saying, please, can you contact us? This is our phone number. We want to talk to you. No reply. And we contacted him. Uh, we send the, another email. No reply. And we contacted the police because the email, it, it was in Turkish. It, the email was very alarming. Um, we contacted the police. Please, we knew just email address. That's all. They found him. He's been sectioned as well. And what I'm saying is both men, middle age, single, and those are risk factors as well. I mean, this is the, um, when we say this to the commissioners, they say to me, um, you are not crisis intervention, you shouldn't do this. This is not your job. I mean, we are a first point of contact, <coughs> therefore we can help those clients. And I don't think some of the commissioners, they understand the role of <coughs> frontline workers and community. Um, organizations. Okay, but the suicide, what is our experience? Can you, uh, it's preventable. Talking all suicide expressions seriously, take, we, we, should, we should take seriously act on them. Holistic approach to client's needs, providing language support advocacy, developing trust in relationship through one-to-one -one mental health support work, helping service users to access available services, and being a solid bridge between service user and the services, providing counseling and support to the families, because suicide has also impact, enormous impact on the family. Um, okay, um, I mean, um, I'm really bit, a little bit optimistic about House of Commons because I was reading uh, the next slide. Uh, House of Commons Mental Health Committee intern report about suicide prevention. Which is, uh, which is good, and um, one of the recommendations, uh, prevention suicide is um, including within the tra non-traditional setting and recognizing the importance of voluntary community organization. I'm optimistic, hopefully, that we can do something. And to conclude, uh, I think suicide is preventable, uh, the next slide, and we have to work together. All the statutory bodies and community uh, organizations, we have to work together to find a solution for, for the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nersel. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Jamal Kabasogulari. I hope I pronounced your name right. He's the GP at the Woodstock uh, Medical Centre, so over to you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to thank the organiser and our host, uh, Heidi Alexander, MP for Evolution East, for this opportunity. And as a healthcare professional, I'm uh, humbled and honoured to be able to speak on this occasion and contribute to this important topic. Uh, I'd like to start with a quick introduction so you know who's speaking to yourselves. And the next slide, please. Uh, I'm, I'm Jamal and I have graduated from Hajjattabe University Medical School in 2008. Uh, I practiced in surgical departments for the next three years in London and then moved to Scotland in Glasgow where I currently practice as a general practitioner. Next slide please. 
Since moving to UK, I've worked actively with many healthcare professional organizations, particularly working with the Turkish speaking community. I've served as the general secretary for the Anglo Turkish Healthcare Professionals Association. You will hear lots of professionals associated, I do apologize. Uh, then I was the vice chair of the Turkish Cypriot Healthcare Professionals Association, and I currently am the treasurer for the European Federation of the Turkish Healthcare Professionals Association. So, um, Besides working directly with these organizations, uh, I'm also involved in Royal College of General Practitioners Junior International Committee uh, as, as the Deputy Chair. And through this organization, we organize exchanges and twinning projects that, that allows collaboration of healthcare professionals all around the world and exchange experiences uh, and learn from each other. And last year, I was invited to Turkish Family Doctors Association's annual conference and we have taken the first steps of starting a twinning project with family physicians from Turkey and the UK. Now, I'd like to dwell a little bit more on that because interesting to me, surprising to me, the request of this contact didn't come from Turkey, it came from the UK. <coughs> a colleague of mine working in North Carolina approached me, he said, Jamal, you know, I know that you're Turkish origin. I said, yes. And he said, look, we need, we need to contact somebody from Turkey, a general practitioner from Turkey, to get some more information because we are struggling uh, in our practice. We have a really big population of uh, Turkish patients in our practice and we're struggling to establish, uh, establish and engage with our communication. We seem to be it seems like we're not understanding each other. And he went on to explain the problem specifically, his words saying, it feels like we're not able to communicate and we're, we're finding it hard to understand their expectations. We are managing to overcome the language barrier most of the time nowadays. We see people coming day in, day out, with tests carried out back home for reasons we do not know and we do not understand. It feels like they do not trust us and they seem to be never satisfied with us unless we send them to the hospital. And I think this is actually a really good starting point to understand some of the challenges of the Turkish speaking community in the UK in accessing healthcare. As we heard today, it's not just the Turkish speaking community, it's a problem of, of any migrant population. Uh, and it's, it's, in the literature, it's well shown that migrant populations do struggle to access and utilize healthcare services compared to their native populations. There's about 120 to 400,000 Turkish speaking people in the UK. And most research, including the embassy resources, put this number to somewhere around 250,000. And even this statement tells you something about the problem. We do not even know the numbers. Exactly. There are a couple of reasons for it. Um, partially it's because the Turkish speaking community is here on, uh, unfortunately, illegal grounds. Uh, so it's hard to uh, maintain and track, track a certain, certain register. Uh, and they belong to a very diverse socioeconomic background, ranging from refugees to pensioners, unfortunately, majority being in the low socioeconomic group. In this respect, studies from Germany shows that Turkish migrants and refugees become dependent on external care 10 years earlier when compared to the native population, 10 years earlier, with increased rates of obesity, smoking, substance misuse, and as we all heard today, mental health problems and suicide. In 2016, me and my colleagues uh, carried out a literature review which was uh, presented at the World Organization of Family Physicians, European meeting in Istanbul. And we looked at studies from the year 2000 onwards, focusing on Turkish-speaking community, a lot, uh, community and identified about 11 articles that focus only the Turkish-speaking community, and about 36 of them more around the uh, general health of the migrant health population uh, that fitted our criteria. Although the purposes and the types of the studies were very different from each other, we were able to identify some common themes in the descriptions of the problems in accessing healthcare. All research unanimously conclude that the Turkish speaking population in the UK is disadvantaged in both the access and utilization of the health NHS services. The most common barrier identified is the language. Even in the migrant population living in the UK for over five years, the overall knowledge of spoken language is rated as poor. There's a high demand for translation services and interpretation services 
but they're not always available. And with the recent cut to NHS, it's getting harder and harder to access that kind of uh, services. The second most important aspect of the barrier is the health beliefs, especially this stigma around the mental health. Uh, is an important aspect of this, and uh, also substance misuse, and this prevents people from seeking help and, and talking about the subject. Migrants are trying to engage with health service as they have been doing back, their home, back in their home countries, and obviously this is not compatible how the health system works in the UK. Finally, most of the literature on the topic concludes that the efforts for, uh, for specifically targeted to Turkish speaking population are sporadic and un uncoordinated at best. Low socioeconomic class, the inability of access to healthcare services, overall worse physical well-being, and poor integration to the community are factors adversely affecting the quality of life of the Turkish-speaking community in the UK. You do not need to be a rocket scientist to understand that there's a problem here. It's, it's well established. It's, you know, it's, ah. So what can we actually do to tackle these issues? Overall, the research in the literature concludes that further research needs to be done, but I think, I think we are beyond that problem. I think if there's no further research needs to be done, I think we have to say that, yes, there's a problem, and move on and how to tackle it, actually this problem. Number of Turkish-speaking healthcare professionals across the European continent has been constantly increasing over the last 10 years. But this raise is not proportional to the raise of the population. And in each of these countries, there's at least one or more professional association, and these organizations have been gathered around the European Wide Federation. Activities of these organizations individually have been well received by the communities, but once again, these activities are uncoordinated and sporadic. And it all depends on who is involved in that particular time. Active work from healthcare professionals is good, but it's not enough. We need official support from the likes of the embassies and consulates. We need support from the local councils and the governments and in institutions to acknowledge that this is an issue and to generate resources, and today have been a great step towards this. So I, once again, thank you very much for this. But perhaps most importantly, we need the community groups, the leaders, the influencers among us, and the community itself to get involved and act. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jamal. I was struck by one of the things you said about um, finding accurate numbers of uh, how many Turkish people there are and the Kurdish people in the UK. And I've got a large Turkish community in my constituency in Lewisham. And I asked my researcher today to interrogate the census statistics, and she said it's not broken down, so yes. I can't tell you. Yes. Um, so I think, that, um, I think that confirms the point you were making. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to ask um, Ertanj Hidayetin, who's an educationalist and columnist on a number of online journals, I think, to talk about the um, role of the media um, in relation to suicide. Pronounced. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm fast developing an inferiority complex because I'm the only one not an expert in the field. But I'll try to do justice to the issue. Uh, I write in a couple of um, uh, electronic newspapers in Turkish and um, I have written about this issue in my column in the past when we had a a number of, a large number of suicides in the community. So I've been, okay, I've come across doing research for this talk uh, with a lot of um, materials which shows that there is a definite correlation between the way newspapers report suicides and, um, and the actual um, suicide incidents. So that's really an important uh, point, and I'll show a couple of um, examples of research done in this area. Uh, one of them is from Australian and New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry, and they say uh, what I just said, that there is definite uh, correlation between the two. And they also say that uh, reporting um, rather than normalizing 
suicidal behavior by reporting it, uh, that they should assist by publicizing alternative coping mechanisms. Because we very much uh, are accustomed to newspapers and other media outlets to sensationalize uh, reporting on issues like suicides, which adversely contribute to more suicides. And this uh, research, really quite a comprehensive research uh, mentioned by the British Medical Journal, it has a couple of interesting points. For example, um, okay, uh, studies measuring the effect of either an entertainment or political celebrity suicide story were 14 times higher, more likely to find a copycat effect than studies that did not. So, I mean, we, we all know cases when a, a famous person commits suicide, especially in, in the in music industry, a number of especially young, young people also sort of copy that and commit suicide. Uh, and also, I, I find that quite interesting, I don't know what you'll think, a uh, research based on televised stories was 82% less likely to report a copycat effect than research based on newspapers. Uh, I'll be interested to see what the experts' views on this, uh, how we can explain that. So they also talk about the fact that media can have a positive role in in this area by reporting it more responsibly. Right, coming to uh, this place on the train, I was sort of engrossed in reading a very detailed account of this uh, issue. Uh, it was advertised as the first social media suicide, and it was written by Rana Dasgupta in the Guardian newspaper. You can copy that the link and read it. I do recommend you to read it. It's really engrossing to read about the case of this young French woman uh, called, what's she called? Um, Oshenia. Yeah, she was called Oshenia. And you'll see a picture of her in a minute. This is her. Uh, she live streamed her own suicides. Uh, prior to that, she live streamed twice on a, on a media outlet called Periscope, which is uh, part, which is controlled by Twitter. Uh, I think I can see a theory and shake. I have never heard of it. But yes, um, and she actually live streamed her own suicide. She walked a very short distance from her, her home to the um, train station and threw herself on the lines and uh, she was hit by the Paris uh, train. And uh, Das Gupta says this about, um, what, what she, he is just quoting what she wrote, what she said in her broadcast. It's the only way to communicate a message. The only way left to ensure the message is taken up. Until you provoke people, they don't understand. But it's really going to be very, very shocking. So honestly, I'm telling you that any children watching, and it's, not, not, it's got nothing to do with sex, please leave. That's what she was saying in her broadcast. Obviously, one of the uh, recent developments, uh, very negative developments in the last 10, 15 years, is this thing called cyberbullying. And that's the definition of cyberbullying from Childline. A person or a group of people uses the internet, mobile phones, and other digital technology to threaten, tease, and abuse someone. It can happen through all those kind of mechanisms. And I, I hadn't heard of this uh, phrase before, cyberbullicide is the relationship between cyberbullying and suicide among youth. Its general focus is the phenomenon of cyberbullying, which we define as suicide indirectly or directly influenced by experiences with online aggression. 
and that's the source there. And there are a few examples of a suicide uh, via uh, media, especially social media. And that's the case of a father of suicide girl, 14, attacks Askefems. You all, you all heard of Askefems' uh, uh, influence in, in suicides. And the uh, 14-year-old girl has taken her own life because she was being uh, that Hannah may have posted some of the hate messages, hate messages or said, it's getting hot. That, that's what the girl said. The source is Daily Mail. And the next one is, on, in 2013, this week, a 15-year-old boy killed himself after being hung on it. The site also allows users to put up video answers Meaning, the, uh, meaning their identities. Joshua Andrew Hansworth, 15, was found hanged after allegedly being bullied. Children from abuse because it creeps into their lives from a barrage of social media. That's another really uh, negative effect of social media. As well as a curse, uh, internet and social media can have a very positive uh, role and uh, responsible reporting of suicide could have a preventative effect on further suicides. And the uh, World Health Organization, uh, I haven't been able to find it, but what I'd, like you to, what I'd like to do is to find it and send it to all Turkish uh, language newspapers and hope that their reporting on these issues could, could improve. Uh, what about the Turkish sort of media I mentioned? Uh, we are really accustomed to hear and, hear and read very graphic images of reporting on news. Uh, I, like many Turkish-speaking people, have a satellite television and uh, I try not to watch the news because it's really graphic in terms of even uh, accidents, um, motorway accidents, and the way they show it is really gruesome. So I try not to put the te television on when the news is on. But uh, my beef is really with the uh, soap operas. Uh, a lot of people are really hooked on soap operas on Turkish satellite television. I put on Facebook, so positive use of the uh, social media, uh, inviting my friends on Facebook to tell me what they think about the effect of uh, watching soap operas on Turkish television. Yuri Skir is one of the best skills in terms of the uh, positive effect of the yeah. media. Yes, well, I can almost convince you about the negative effects of media. But on the positive side, uh, media is, a, is such a strong source. We can use it to access people anytime, anywhere. So I would like to read it general. So there is research about it. We know that there is a problem that suicidal thoughts, mental health problems are much more common among Turkish speaking communities in Europe. And, um, and there is an accessibility issue. So e health using internet to access. Um, it might be an option. So I will be talking about uh, my project, which I'm conducting in the Netherlands and in the UK among the Turkish-speaking community um, dealing with suicidal thoughts. So, first of all, why do we need an online intervention? Well, um, what we have been talking about so far, getting help from mental health services is a challenge. And 60% um, of suicidal people uh, having suicidal thoughts, they, they have no access to mental health services a year before they make an attempt. And this situation is even more worrisome among ethnic minorities because of the cultural barriers, language barrier, barriers that we have mentioned. They have less access to mental health services. And um, so how do we make, how do we tackle with this inaccessibility issue? And 
And one way, but I'm not going to talk about this in detail because I don't want to talk more. Uh, <coughs> we need to make services more um, up appealing for the needs and expectations. We have to address the language barriers, the cultural context they are presenting. They are not separate from the mental health problems they are presenting. And the, another way is using media to access people, given the advantages of media. So what are these advantages? The advantages um, is accessibility, obviously. If we cannot live without our iPhones, we cannot live without computers. So we can access, uh, we, we live our lives online as well, most of the time. So uh, given that, we can access to suicidal people anytime, anywhere, by using internet as a channel. Um, so given this advantage, the main aim of my project is to um, adopt an e-health intervention, e-health and internet therapy for suicidal thoughts according to Turkish speaking community in the Netherlands and in the UK and testing whether this form of seeking help is an offering help is um, acceptable and also effective in helping them to manage their suicidal thoughts. Yes. So why Turkish speaking community in Europe? So given because we said that the topic of the talk is uh, the Turkish Kurdish secret diaspora in Europe. So giving you an European perspective on the issue, um, and I will refer to Emilia's talk as well. So uh, suicidal talks and attempted suicide is, is higher, and especially among Turkish young women, Turkish speaking young women, aged between 14 and 26. For example, in Germany, it's six, almost six times higher compared to native German women and women from other ethnic backgrounds. And similar statistics have been reported in the Netherlands, Switzerland. We don't know about UK, but I think you have an idea from uh, Lucille's talk about the statistics in, in England. And um, so, as like Armenia said, we have to give voice uh, to the communities in order to be able to adapt to services according to their needs and expectations. So, um, in 2014 and 15, I did interviews and group, focus group meetings with the communities in the Netherlands and in the UK. And one of the key messages from these meetings was that suicide, um, it was seen as failing responsibility towards family, and especially among second, third generation, Turkish speaking migrants. So that was one of the psychological uh, factors leading to suicide in the Netherlands and in the UK. So, um, while I was adopting my uh, internet intervention according to Turkish speaking communities, uh, I took this as a, so I adopted it accordingly. I tried to address this uh, fear of failing responsibilities aspect in the intervention. So, how does this internet uh, therapy work? Probably this is a question everyone has in their minds at the moment. So first of all, we can go to the next one. Um, so the internet therapy is called Imajana, and the name is actually coming from the interviews. It means crushing your life energy. Don't crush your life energy. I try to give a supportive message saying that uh, your job, your life, is part of ours. So we, we don't want you to separate your life from ours. So that was the message, but some people find the name very scary. Um, so people go to a website, um, they register themselves. So that gives more anonymity. They don't have to tell anybody that they want to use this service. And then uh, we send them information letters and in information package and consent form. They fill in the consent form and fill in a baseline questionnaire. And if they are eligible, meaning that if they have suicidal thoughts, then they are either placed to an intervention group, which means they start the therapy immediately, or, or they place into a waiting list group, which means they first do, um, they first have access to an information page, and then after a six weeks waiting, waiting time, they start the intervention. So that's the only way you can see if this therapy works or not. So that's the main reason of doing this uh, 
experiment. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. So I want to give you some snapshots about the content of the intervention to give you an idea about how a culturally adapted online therapy might look like. And um, so this is from the second session. So it's a six weeks long therapy aiming to reach people really thinking about suicide. So, so the aim of the therapy is to help them to manage their life better. Because suicidal thoughts, um, it can really, uh, it can influence uh, your life, your daily functioning. Because thinking about them is very stressful. Um, and in the second session, so we teach them to evaluate their feelings. So they learn to detect the negative feelings and they learn to um, detect, to understand when they are going to have suicidal thoughts and what, what, can, what kind of coping skills they can use to prevent them from getting worse. And uh, I use images instead of numbers because uh, Turkish speaking people I interviewed, they said we don't, we don't express our feelings in terms of numbers. It's difficult for us. So that's why I use some images to help them uh, identify their feelings uh, better. In the next one. And this is um, another snapshot from the content of the therapy. So um, I also consulted um, professionals, and Esra was one of the professionals I consulted. Uh, and she advised me to uh, use cultural examples, so cultural cases, in order to make it more relevant to this population. So I use some uh, pictures, um, hoping that it looks it looks like a, a typical uh, Turkish speaking guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to be positive views about it, um, and some some stories that I I learned from the interviews. Of course, I changed the details in order to protect the images of the cases. And next slide, please. And that's another example of how it looks like. Um, again, the cultural examples and the pictures, helping them to identify themselves with the therapy much more. And, um, yes. And how do I reach people? So how do I let people know about this intervention? Obviously, I use uh, social media, mainstream media, newspaper advertisements, all sorts of channels. I also attend uh, organized community meet meetings and actually this is one way of making it more public. So thanks for coming. Hopefully you will spread the word. Um, and um, so the promotion, because it's the study has been conducted in the Netherlands and in the UK and I'm aiming to reach first, second and third generation. So the promotion is in three languages, Turkish, Dutch and English. And also the Turkish is available in Turkish, Dutch and in English. So, are users of the survey, are they satisfied with it? I think that's the next question we have in your minds. No one committed suicide yet, and they are pretty happy about it. So, um, some, people, some people said, so the therapy helped them to manage their thoughts, but they also learned useful life skills as a result of doing this therapy. Because the therapy is also addressing depression, um, and anxiety as well. And like I said, it helped, it helped them to control their worries, to manage their worries, and carry on their daily tasks in a more effective way. And um, because the content of the therapy has been uh, adapted according to uh, the needs and expectations of this population, uh, some of them said they felt like they were talking to a close friend. So they, were, they reported feeling this cultural familiarity with the therapy. And what are the user profile? I think who are using the therapy? That's another question you might ask. So they are usually female. No surprises, they are female. They are more, much more open to seek help <coughs> in an earlier stage. So that also confirms Musil's points. And they are usually aged between 18 and 25. And uh, they are usually university graduates. That's, I think, also not surprising. Um, and uh, they are usually single. 
And um, people who are having mild and moderately severe suicidal thoughts, they are using the therapy. So it is appealing for people rarely thinking about suicide, but also people who are thinking about suicide all the time. Uh, and they are usually not seeking help from any mental health service. And the Facebook and the other social media strategies like Instagram, Twitter, they are much more uh, effective in terms of reaching people. So, positive effects of media. <laughs> and um, that's about it really, that's about what I need to say. Foundation Trust um, works in the Department of Psychology at Homerton Hospital. It's a very uh, a noisy presentation. Or at least we're trying to get. <laughs> <laughs> Are we there? Yes. Yeah.